Our pastor has been on vacation for a couple of weeks, which uh, is, uh, is a very good thing. I know he needed some rest, and I don't know how much rest you got. Vacations kind of tend to be work, but <laughs> we, miss, we missed you while you are gone, Pastor. I just want to say, Pastor's going to come and speak this morning, and uh, I just want to just take a moment just while he's here uh, and in front of all of you just to say how much I appreciate him, his leadership, the vision that God has given him, and he is, he is an incredible discipler of people, a discipler of his leaders. Uh, he's not only my leader, my pastor, um, but he's my, a mentor and a friend. And I don't think every pastor on a staff would say that of their senior pastor, but I know I'm speaking for all of us as a staff, and I'm speaking for you as a church how much you love and appreciate our leader. And so I want you just, as he comes to share this morning, if you just give him honor and recognition this morning. Okay. If I was Donald Trump, I'd go. <laughs> a little embarrassing. Man, I, I tell you, um, I love all of you guys. Hey, I, I, I miss you individually. Uh, when you can't be here or when I'm gone, my heart's here. I can't get away from it. Um, you're each individuals to me, not just a corporate number of people. You're each have a name, a face, some with hair, some without hair, <laughs> some with funky hair and weird hair, and some with regular hair. <laughs> Jenna, I got a favor for you. I know you're a beaut beautiful hairdresser, and you really have seen your work. You make people look good. And there's this style of hair now where the young people will cut real short on the sides and then leave the top long. Could you start a trend where the cool thing is to grow it on the sides and cut it off <laughs> on the top? If you, can, if you can make that happen, I got about $1,000 for you. I, uh, I, uh, we had, a, we had a good time. We went to Rome, went to Malta where Paul was uh, uh, shipwrecked. Pretty cool to see some of these places. Uh, I actually didn't even think about it, but I'm preaching from Romans with the, the, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And, uh, but, you know, we had, a, we had a good time. We were, on, we were on land a lot. We did cruise, and at night you, you, you thought you were eating for 10 people. And it is true that I ate about three or four desserts every night. And um, we did have a few extracurricular activities that we played on ship. <laughs> Bouncing balloons around. A few of us at a table. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to my son. <laughs> go to last week's sermon online and you'll see him making fun of me and Susan in our vacation activity. Um, 27 years, it's a, it's an emotional day for me. I, I look out and I see every one of you. When I was called of God, it was about five years before that 27 years to start a church and I wasn't sure how that would ever happen. I was absolutely frightened to pieces because uh, you know, I worked with a really good preacher, and I, I didn't preach. I didn't preach a whole lot. I didn't have much experience, but I, I really kept just urging and urging and urging to do this. So I thought I'd go to Kansas City, and Pastor Yulstead talked me into staying in Iowa. And the, with the blessing of Pastor Wheats, uh, we planted this church. It was a, a district uh, work where churches from all over the state of Iowa and the descendants of God sent in money to help us start. There was. Uh, the closest thing to a mother church was Berean in the sense that the little core that I had that I began with, I think by the time it all sh shook down counting my, my daughter who was two. Uh, and by the way, go to my Facebook page and you'll see a picture of how Susan and I used to look. I looked as good as you kids right here. I was good looking. 
I had hair, I had muscle, I didn't have a gut. That would be ice cream gut right there. Uh, but we do get old, don't we? And you're not going to stop it, Holly. You're on a fast pace, girl. <laughs> now, did you turn 40 yet? You did, didn't you? Shh, she said no. She's lying in church. Anyway. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I, I fasted and prayed for several days, and one of the things that God told me, he's, and I was trying to figure out, what do I do, you know? And I knew that I, I didn't, there's certain gifts I just don't have. And, and God said, don't worry about it. And it, like I heard in my spirit, not only the words, but the emotion of the words, I just need a pastor. You don't need to do anything to build this church. I'll build my church. Just be who I've called you to be, be a pastor. In our culture today, we have performance music mimics Holy Spirit empowerment, just like a lot of marriages get married and they have words they use, but they're not really by the Jesus, by His Spirit married because it's the Holy Spirit that does the mystery Paul talks about in Ephesians 5 and in the Old Testament where two become one, one flesh. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And we have a lot of CEOs administrating and running religious organizations where the people talk about the doctrines of God, but they're actually dead bones. Jesus called it out. And I'm gonna tell you something. I'm committed to saying today, 27 years later, to the fullness of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit in a person because you cannot become a Christian knowing the Bible and the theology and believing a belief system. It happens no matter where you are by a quickening, a work of the power of God and His Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that comes into you and changes you. You are not born of flesh, the Bible says. You are born of Spirit. Jesus says, you are, it's a spiritual rebirth. You must be born of spirit. Be born again. Holy Spirit birth, where Christ does something by his spirit. And I'm telling you, the mechanism of the church is supernatural, invisible work of the spirit where the power of grace, we can understand the definition and miss its power because the power of grace is the spirit to work deep into our hearts. Are you with me? I want to continue. I want to be a true church that worships God, not just sings songs. A church that not just claps at the end of the song to affirm whatever was sung or the music, but claps to God and uses their lips as Paul exhorts to giving thanks to God. That is the fruit of our lips praising and thanking God. In other words, words. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Not just. Are you with me? Today, I come to you as a servant. There's a verse in Colossians 1.25 says, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And that's a di little different version there, but it it's the same thing. In other words, God has given each of us the truth. And by the Spirit of God, by the leading of the Spirit, we give different pieces of the truth to different people at different times as the Spirit leads us to impact. But it's our job to bring truth, to bring the Word of God, the Bible, to people, to share it with our whole hearts. You see, listen to me, young person. I want you to hear this loud and clear. We're not called to be creative. We're called to be obedient. We're not called to be innovative. We're called to be obedient. We're not called to have great ideas and great thoughts. We're called to be obedient. Simply to preach the Word of God, not our opinions, not our great ideas, not our innovations, God's Word. The word minister in the Greek, it literally means to be a servant, one who executes the commands of another. It's a humble word, a lowly place, one of no honor, no rank, just a simple task of giving the word. So listen to this. God says this. I want you to hand this stuff that I give you in my word. I want you to make sure it gets to the table the way it came out of the kitchen, servant. 
Make sure that what I give you gets to the table the way it comes out of the kitchen. That's all. You don't have to spruce it up. You don't have to be creative and innovative. You just take what I've given you and pass it out. That's all. We're stewards of the Word of God. And moreover, it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it is required as stewards that they be found faithful. So share the Word. Teach the Word. Witness the Word. Be full of the Word. To get to bar mitzvah as a young Jewish boy or, or a girl, their equivalent of a bar mitzvah, you had to memorize the first five books of the law. The Pentateuch. Okay? The old, first five books of your Old Testament. Okay? Well, we can't do that. They did by the time they were 12 or 13, but we can't do that. We got too much stuff to do. Too many things to repair. Too many activities to attend. Too many games to watch. Too many of this. Too much of that. The psalmist said, in thy law do I meditate day and night. And you'll be like a tree planted by the water and will not be moved when the winds come. Let me tell you something, guys. The Word has to be full in us, alive in us, so that out of it the Spirit of God, the love of God would flow. And I've titled this the church. The word church is ecclesia. Or in the Old Testament, there's another word in, in the Hebrew, in the Greek. It's a diff this word. But basically, it's assembly is what it is. Or community. Listen to me. As a church, what I want us to be about is being a community. You see, I, I, I said to the Lord, I know in starting a church, what ends up happening, I'd lived long enough by then, I was 37, I'd lived long enough to realize that many times when the person that starts a work gets old, gets confused, ineffective, cynical, and, and, you know, because you do when you get older, sometimes you get cynical or you get whatever else you get, uh, that the church that they tried to build for God is not God's church but their church because it's all about them. I'm just a servant. I'm just a waiter to bring a teaching or a, a, a message from God and from his word to say, here it is. And every one of you, God looks at you and he values you just as much. We all need God, and none of us are good enough in ourselves. We need God, and the only goodness that flows is from God's Word and His Spirit in us, that spiritual life that lives and flows out of us, and that's what I want us to be. So I said, God, why, how do I keep this thing from, when I'm starting it, I don't have hardly, I don't have, but the, the beginning, I didn't have anybody. By then, I think I had three couples and whatever kids they had, and, uh, and, I, and I, 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 I said, how do I do that? And and so, I, it just came to me, just kind of clear, well, when it's theirs, it's not your church. I don't want it to be my church. When it's their church, you know, people clean their house, and people have keys to their houses. So, I'm a little old-fashioned. I like, you know, if you come here, this is your church. We know you by name and face. You want a key? It's your church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're the church. A church that never was back in the original, in the Bible, when it mentions the word church, it's talking about the people of God, not buildings, not a location. It was talking about a community of believers. And today in this passage uh, that's titled, maybe in your Bible, Love, I see church. I see what a church should be, who we should be, in Romans chapter 12. And think of it, all this, people clean and they pray when they clean all this building, I can't believe it. 94,000 square feet, people that come in here and pray and clean this place, volunteering, take care of the yard and the flowers and all around, volunteering. Why? Because they are the church. We are the church. And guys, it's been my heart to find prayerfully, spirit-led, prayerfully find pastors that have pastor's heart that truly love people. Now, I know I've made a lot of mistakes. I'm sure I've hurt some of you. And it's, it's easy to, to dwell on, to look at something. You know, I, I can see this way, but I can't see this. So anytime you see something, you help me and the other pastors. But let me tell you what a pastor is, or one that cares for, prays for, 
shares truth sometimes takes risks to help you also see this that you can't see. And I'm telling you, I know that the gift of pastor that one of the fivefold is in my heart, and I believe it's in the other pastor's hearts. From handsome, strong Pastor Hawkins and the brilliant Gary Walter all the way down to me. It's like Paul said, the least of all. I'm, I'm uh, my son. I couldn't believe I watched him preach. How many of you weren't here last week? It was a great sermon. If you weren't here, you get online and watch it. Powerful. The Jesus Is series. I'm preaching next week on Jesus said, I am. I am. Who is he? I am. Who is he? You get to know him, you're going to love him. You get to know him, you're going to trust him. We want you to tell you about who this Jesus is. Pastor Hawkins, when I was gone, preached a great message. See, this, is, this can't be about a person. And, 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 you know, so for some of you, this is a real struggle, you know, because it's very difficult to get past personality and style. But in the center of it all, we're all different. And it's truth, and it's the Word. And we're just table waiters, bringing what God gives us from bread off of the Word and saying, the living Word, here He is. Here's the truth. It's not about any of us. I'm not threatened. If they can preach better than me, I'd rather sit there with you and listen. It's all different because it's about God. It's about Jesus. That's what this church is. It's about Jesus. And it's about community and how we treat each other. So as we read here in Romans 12, let me start in verse number 9. I have three simple thoughts. Love must be sincere. The first one, let me just say, get the first point up there, is devoted to one another. Devoted to one another. Look what it says. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one ab another above yourselves. Jumping down to verse 13. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Jump to verse 15 and 16. Bless those uh, no, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position, do not be conceited. And if you'll jump up, it's not on the screen, but if you mark in Romans 12, uh, the second part of verse 3, it says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with a sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, if you think you're somebody, you're probably not. Because God has gifted you in a special place or called you or uses you in a special place, those are the gifts of God. You're nothing but flesh. And apart from God, you can do nothing, Jesus said. It's all to God's glory, what he does in you. And I don't, you know, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says, you know, if you've got someone of high importance and position and the, the world looks up to them, they got a lot of money, they got this, they got that, they're talented, whatever, and you say, here, come sit in the place of honor up here between the teenagers. Maybe it's not such a place of honor, but somewhere. And then you have someone come in and they got on, you know, clothes that are all holy, and I'm not talking about the $300 jeans that are purposely holy that you buy that you think are so cool, and I think aren't. Not. Not. Anybody got a knife? Make my suit cool. It's weird, man. It's weird. I'm a 53 boy. I'm a 53 model. 1953. That's what I am. Not cool. You say to that person that's poor, maybe he smells, maybe he's down on his luck, go, you know, huh, okay, sit over, over there in the corner. It's not good. Listen to me. Community, church, is about community, and it's about one another, and our love has to be sincere. I want you to know something. The thing that only the Holy Spirit can do and did in me is I do sincerely love people, but I'm not perfect in it because I'm not God. God is perfect in it. And love is character. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Singularly, God is love. And they that know God will love. If you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. That is the character. Love is character, people. It's character. It's all the definition of what love is in 1 Corinthians 13. Patient and kind, not selfish, not rude, not boastful, not proud. All these things, right? 
And let me tell you something. Popular song when I was growing up, it's what the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's much too little love. What the world. You guys, you guys are too easily entertained. <laughs> you need to go to Branson with the old people. That's what you need. Well, some entertainment. Honestly, character is love. It's how you behave. It's how you treat another person. Love must be sincere. Sincerely love another person. That's what, as a church, and it's so easy uh, to, to not be. And the, the first thought is to be devoted to each other in brotherly love. My children love each other. My son, he's not here today. He really, he really wanted to be, but Pastor Elizabeth I, it's my daughter-in-law now. When I call her Pastor Liv, she's not pastoring anymore, but Elizabeth's uh, grandmother died, and they're at the funeral today, the, the funeral's today down in uh, wherever they went. <laughs> About seven hours from here. And uh, he loves his sister. His sister loves him. And they may say things, and they may know each other's faults, but guess what? They look past it, and they still love each other, and that's what a church should be. Do you think that all of you are without fault or blame or can't have someone be critical of you? And here's what the devil does. As we get to know each other more and more, we know each other's weakness and their frailties and their tendencies that aren't so perfect. And the devil whispers, and he, he talks to us, and he criticizes, and he lets us see the couple of dark spots in each of our lives so that we get critical and judgmental. And like the old song says, there shall be showers of blessing. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. In other words, be merciful. We need a shower, a flood of mercy, not just a little drop. And the Bible says, if you want mercy, be merciful. If you want to be forgiven, forgive. And you can get critical and you can have someone hurt you because the world will. But guess what? You have to forgive. And love is sincere and it develops itself in character. You see, what you do in your giftedness and for God, you can be powerful. You can be a good teacher, a good preacher, anointed to pray. You may see miracles happen. You may do whatever. You know, a great music, musician, that doesn't matter. But if character isn't infused, it becomes, it becomes in it, in the midst of it. If the character nature of love, of God's love by His Spirit isn't in the very middle of it penetrating, then it's just a bunch of noise, clanging, symbol. It's what Paul said in first 13, first Corinthians 13, that everything that you do, all the gifts, is just a bunch of clanging stuff, that speaking in a language or whatever it is, love is the greatest because God is love and God in you will love. And as a church, that's the thing to mark. People are attracted of how you love and forgive and merciful and kind and gracious to each other, the way you love each other. Young people, your group, the way Luke, Jenna, love you, Zach and Mary, and having a baby, push, 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 Marin, push. She's having a baby right now. That was a side. Is that okay, Pastor Jeff? It's your daughter-in-law. I shouldn't have said that, should I? See, I have this bad habit when I'm old. I preach, I know what I'm saying, and then I say stuff like that because I don't follow my notes. <laughs> Pastor Hawkins, he doesn't do that. But anyway... The way they love each other, the way they love you, they love each other. And when kids come to your group, when they see you loving and not bickering, you know, by the way, one thing about having children, if they're middle school girls, they're going to fight. If you've got two middle school girls, they're going to have problems because that's a hard time. And if they don't, you're the super parent of the universe. In middle school, love each other. Forgive each other. Understand, we're all processed like Pastor uh, Luke preached here a while back. We're in process. God is working with us. So be devoted to each other, church, in brotherly love. And honor another above yourself. When you, the Bible says, prefer one another in love. You see, there's some of the songs y'all like. I don't like them. I don't. I like the word, but I just don't like them. And some of the songs I like, you don't like. But I don't care. <laughs> I care about your heart and you. Okay? 
But here's the thing, I ought to be overjoyed when I see someone entering in the presence of God, if it's someone. And let me tell you something. To be devoted to each other, to honor one another, to prefer one another in love, means that you honor and prefer your grandparents. One of the sins of America is how we treat old people. It's true. And how older people treat young people. In other words, guys, listen to me. This isn't middle school worship here. This isn't high school worship. They have it just the way they want it. Pastor Courtney does things up there in third, fourth, and fifth grade. I go, what is this going on? Because I'm not a third, fourth, fifth grader, but she gets it. She's called to it. But this is when you have fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way to 90. And so our approach in everything we can do can be very selfish. But the Bible says, prefer one another in love. In other words, have some character about you. Care about a person. Love a person. Speak to a person. Young people, don't walk by old people even though they're wrinkled and ugly and bent over. Don't. And old people, grab them by the collar and pull them down. They're, you're young enough they don't bruise. Just knock them on the ground if they don't talk to you. Just kick one of them teenagers say, hey! I might be old, but I'm still breathing. Ha! <sighs> Smell my bad breath. <laughs> so be in the church. Be real. Care about each other. You think you're not without fault. You're wrong. You think your breath doesn't stink sometimes. You're wrong. <laughs> we need to be devoted to one another. And we need, second thing, to be zealous for God. Look at that verse number 11 and 12. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The Bible says to spur one another on toward love, to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up, to build yourself up. Listen to me, it's easy to get complacent, to get lukewarm. You gotta fire yourself up when we worship God. You can sit there and you can do like this and intellectually listen to something and just go like that. Or you can say, you know what, no. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that's within me. The soul is mind, will, and emotion. You pour yourself into it. You're singing unto the Lord. You're worshiping God with everything within you. You use your lips. You praise God. You have zealousness toward witness, toward serving, toward loving, toward giving, toward being forgiving, toward the body of Christ, toward everything, toward one another. Be zealous toward God. Seek Him with all your heart. Seek His face. Be joyful. You got hope, the world's trouble. Boy, bless those people going through that devastation, those hurricanes. Pray for them. But guess what? This world is not our home. We have a home we're looking forward to, like we say. And there's many reasons to get downhearted. But don't let, don't look down. Look up. This, we're just passing through here. We're eternal beings. We're eternal family of God. We're forever you got Jesus in your heart. We're going to be forever with the Lord in heaven. So be joyful and don't sad sack, you know. You know. I'm holy. Praise God. I'm a member of the Assemblies of God. Hallelujah. No, oh, we got hope, guys. There's nothing that can take away our hope. Be joyful. That's what a church should be, a celebration. We come together and we celebrate. We're joyful. We're glad to see each other. We're loving each other. We're reaching out to each other. We're encouraging each other. Patient in affliction. Guys, don't give up. Trouble's going to come, Jesus said. But be patient. Be faithful in prayer. Be zealous, in other words, to let the zealous of God for God in prayer and, 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 and all of that. And we need to Going back to devoted one another, we need to share with God's people who are in need and thank God for that. We had someone that had a child that has a, a very serious issue. We've had children that, with cancer. We've taken offerings and money just flows in and you guys are just generous to give. That's what we ought to do. We ought to help each other. That's why in Acts, Luke records the early church, they would share things in common that they need so that people weren't, weren't without need and they were being persecuted. They broke bread together daily. They were encouraging. They were hospitable. They were together. Just do it. 
Did you know that Matthew, Levi, when Jesus called him to be a disciple, Matthew, that wrote the Gospel of Matthew, did you know the first thing he did when he started to follow Jesus? He was a snake tax collector under the authority of the Roman government. He was a sinner. The Pharisees, the hypocrites, they, they said, you're eating with sinners, Jesus. Yeah, Levi, he was a sinner, but he got saved. The first thing he did was throw a banquet in honor of Jesus, Luke records, and invited all of his other sinners in, all the other tax collectors, because he knew what it was to be lonely and be hated by the Jews. Because Matthew had turned his back. He had turned his back on his Jewish faith, on the law of God. And he was a scoundrel. The lowest, uh, the Jews hated those tax collectors. And let me tell you something. You open your home, you show hospitality, you do something not only for the people in the church, but outside the church. We're number one to be devoted to each other, but we're also as a church, to become the church and community of God. We have to stir each other to be, to be zealous for God and the things of God. And finally, we need to bless our enemies. In other words, there's a world out there that may hate us because they hated Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Persecute us because we know it's going to come when we stand up for right. You, you know, so, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Let's look at the scriptures here, starting in, in reference to being uh, blessing your enemies. Look at verse 14 of Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. One of the problems in the Christian church is we take up offenses. The enemy whispers to us, we won't forgive, we get bitter. And bitterness, it says, defiles not only us, our family, but everybody around us because we will not let go and forgive and not be merciful. And it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. If people do something against you, it's evil, it's wrong, it's sinful, then you want to get back. You want to do something to hurt them back. You want to fight back. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. And here it's talking about not only within the church, but also outside the church of other people. If it's all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, verse 18. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Love gives, guys. Love forgives. That's the two things. It gives and it forgives. A Christian is a forgiving person and a giving person. And when you have someone against you, let God, you know, someone does something against you, let God deal with it. You, it's not for you to deal with. If you start looking out at the faults of others, you'll get caught in a trap. And you'll be caught up with evil. You know, when someone does something evil against you and you do the same thing to get back to them, you're the same as they are. It doesn't matter who did it first. There's, it's, there's no joy or peace or happiness deep inside your soul. When you hold on to stuff, let it go. The most gracious, merciful people I've ever met in my life, well, honestly, and I say this because they say things privately or did. Pastor Yul says, gone in Georgine. They always go, oh, that's a long time ago. Oh, I forgave that a long time. Oh, they didn't mean that. Oh, it's okay. And they're just like, they just don't hold a grudge. It's just not there. And that's a beautiful thing. Don't let evil, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 17. And then it says, don't be overcome. Verse 21, look at the the contrast of both verses, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, when someone that's your enemy comes against you, does something to hurt you, it's evil. The enemy is going to whisper to you, going to try to destroy you, going to try to destroy you. If you get better, it'll destroy your family, it'll destroy everybody, it'll destroy your church, and you lose joy, and nobody wants to be around that kind of ickety, ickety, ickety stuff. In Greek, that means junk. Don't let evil turn you evil. But bless your enemies, bless your neighbors, bless your brothers, love them, and let it be with great character. And it can only happen by the Spirit. Let me tell you something. We're headed somewhere forever family. If you really, truly are born again by the Spirit and have Jesus, then we're going to spend the eternity together. And I do not want to sit down with the Lord, this person, that person, say, hey, you never forgave him. You know, and you kept asking me to forgive, and I kept saying, I'm not forgiving you until you forgive, because I told you that in the Word. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. I told you that plain as, how many times did you hear it preach? You're bitter, you're unforgiving, you hold a grudge, let it go. I'm not letting you up here. 
You didn't offer forgiveness. You stood in there and you were just bitter as could be. That is the biggest trap. And let me tell you something. The craziness in our culture and the culture wars and all over the social media and all over the news, forget that stuff. Let me tell you something. We call ourselves Christians, but we can be mean as snot standing up for maybe what we believe is right and true. Don't do that stuff. Be kind. Be nice to people. Be loving. You hear me? Are you with me? Devoted to one another, zealous for God, and blessing your enemies. That's what I think a church does. And what we're about, when I started the church 27 years ago, the popular thing was that every church has to have a mission statement and every church has to have a vision statement. So I thought, well, what is the vision? Because I'm I'm not wired like that. I'm not that smart. I couldn't think anything. I just paused and suddenly the light went on. It said, vision, heaven. Then the scripture that I had memorized, Colossians 3, uh, either one or two, I believe it's two, set your affection on things above, not on the earth. Be heavenly minded. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Heaven minded. Heaven is our vision. Eternity. We're eternal beings. We're not living temporary. We're just passing through. Tent dwellers. And then secondly, to go to heaven and take as many as we can with us, which is the gospel message Jesus said, go into all the world and preach this gospel. Be faithful stewards of my word. Teach it. Preach it. Share it. Love it. Show it to people. Live it. Let it be alive in you. Let it be light. You embody, as Pastor Austin said, the presence of God because my spirit's in you. You embody the truth of God, the word of God, because I'm the living word and I'm in you. And you, you embody the truth to give to other people. So let that light shine. Guys, listen to me. I want us to be the church, an eternal church, and see that what we do is done in the core of true love and sincerity and not out of any kind of manipulation. I'm not good enough to manipulate anybody. Okay? Now, if I was in a classroom at North Central, I would get a D on this sermon. D as in dog. It was a dog sermon. But I think before God, I get an A plus because I've given you exactly what God gave me. See, see how he's got his hair cut short all around the edge in that long. <laughs> I see. So I see some of you out here that you're praying for the same change of popularity. Let me tell you something. Learn to forgive. Live a little more loving and gracious and merciful. Let the showers of mercy flow from you the way you want them to flow from God. And let's be the church, and let's not look back. Let's look forward, and let's fulfill our calling. This is your church because you are the church, the people of God, the true believers. Universally around the world, you have the church, the believers and followers of Jesus, and we have now a local assembly, a community of believers we call New Hope because we are here to offer new hope to all that we see, and that's our calling. Give them some hope. People have lost hope. There's nothing to hope in in this world. Give them hope. Give them Jesus. He's the answer. Amen? If you're here today as as we close here, and you have never had a peace that you know for sure, if you were to die, you have that hope of heaven. You know for sure Christ has forgiven you and come into your life. You're going to have to ask you to stand in just a minute. And if you're here and you know that Jesus has saved you, but... There's an element of that where you want to be stirred up and zealous for God, and you want to get a relationship with mankind, whoever it might be. It could be an enemy. You bless them. If they need water, you give to them. If they need eat food, you give it to them. You bless them and let God deal with them. It's not your job. Don't carry resentment, and you need to let go. You need to forgive. You need to have the joy of hope and afflic- of, of patience with affliction. You need to get stirred up and zealous for God, or you need to, to deal with hurt from enemies. Evil has overcome you. It's changed you. You're hardened on the inside. Stay soft and sweet and tender on the inside. And be tough on the outside so that, like duck off a back, water off a duck's back, rather, that hurts just roll and flow off of you. But on the inside, you're full of love. I can tell you, I'm looking out here, I'm not just looking at 
heads, I'm looking in faces. You think I love you. I can't even begin to compare to how much God loves you. And he says, I'll forgive you. I'll empower you, I'll change you. And you can go from here not embittered and hurt. Young people, some of you have been so hurt. And if you haven't, you'll face it. Boys hurt girls. Girls compete and hurt other girls. Sometimes we get married and we mean well, but we're imperfect. And we forget where we began. Let it go. I want us all to be in heaven forever, family. Wouldn't it be a shame that anyone here today would not be in heaven someday? If you go back to Romans again and just go to the next chapter, number 13, look what he says starting in verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandments there are, are summed up in one rule. In other words, the whole law, the do's and don'ts are fulfilled if you just have this one thing, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. You know why I love you, brother? Because you love that way. That's what Jesus did when he changed your heart. You're my brother forever. Brothers. It's not a mask. It's not a pretension. We get caught up with so much when it comes down to simple, simple. Love God, love man. And it's by the Spirit who is love. God himself in us.